Hello, I'm Raphael Chacon, director of the Montana Museum of Art and Culture, and it's a pleasure to welcome you back to Bookish Reveals, the sixth installment of our um, seven-part program in which we discuss the genre of the artist book. Uh, but first, it's important to acknowledge that the Montana Museum of Art and Culture is on the Aboriginal territories of the Salish and Kalispell peoples. And today we honor the path that they have always showed us in caring for this place for generations to come. And we at the museum like to add that art has always been a part of this place. We also want to send a shout out to all of our healthcare professionals and first responders making extraordinary sacrifices during this time of crisis in our uh, country. Uh, so before I describe today's program and introduce our guest speaker, uh, allow me to thank our generous sponsors. Uh, first of all, the Montana Arts Council and then Humanities Montana, Montana for the distribution of CARES Act dollars that have made uh, much of this program possible. I also want to thank our wonderful cinematographer, Eileen Rafferty, who is presently behind the camera. Uh, this program coincides with an exhibition at the Montana Museum of Art and Culture in Missoula, and it's titled Bookish, Selections from the Dan Weinberg Collection. The show runs until December 12th in the Henry Malloy Gallery in the University of Montana's PAR TV Center. This exhibition features a remarkable array of books, and these are artist books, the work of New York City publisher Vincent Fitzgerald. We hope you can visit the show in the time that's left, um, and if not, check out our virtual tour of this beautiful exhibition um, at our webpage. And that webpage is umt.edu forward slash Montana Museum. umt.edu forward slash Montana Museum. There are also videos of all of these books being opened page by page, and those are posted on our YouTube channel. So look us up. So it's a pleasure to introduce today's guest artist. Her name is uh, Audra Loyal. Um, and she will be describing the physical art of bookbinding and the structure of the book itself. And she'll be revealing some innovative specimens from the Weinberg Collection. Uh, when she's finished with her presentation, and if there's time, we'll read questions from the audience. And I invite you to use the chat button at the, uh, at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and we'll do our best to read your questions aloud. This program is being recorded and will be posted on our YouTube uh, channel if you wish to return to it or share it with friends. So, Audra Loyal is the owner of the Vestiary Book Restoration and Bindery in Missoula, Montana. She's an artist who's been making things as long as she can remember. Uh, after a two-year stint in Gifuken, is that correct? Gifu. Gifuken, Japan, she landed in Montana in 2005 as the first resident of the Clay Studio of Missoula. But it was her love of book finding and book conservation skills that she had acquired while attending UC Davis and University of Montana's Mansfield Library that led her to start her own business in 2008. I believe it was at the Mansfield where we became acquainted with each other. I so. and, and I learned about your amazing craftsmanship. <laughs> the Vestiary provides book repair and conservation services in addition to a wide variety of handmade journals sketchbooks, and a, an eclectic collection of used books. And I think you're going to show us some of your handiwork if today. If we have time, sure. I hope so. Uh, during the pandemic, Audra relocated her business to her studio where she, uh, her home studio where she has finally been reunited with her beloved board shear. <laughs> and if you don't know what a board shear is, and I personally don't, uh, I guess we'll all stay tuned. Uh, welcome, Audra. Thank you for having me. Nice to be here. Yeah, a board shear is basically if a paper cutter and a table had a baby. Oh. So it's a paper cutter that has about, I think mine is about a 34 inch blade. Uh -huh. So it's for precise cutting of uh, very large, thin pieces of material. Very nice, yeah. very nice. Yeah. Well, thank you for having me here. And I'm excited to start looking at the books that uh, you've selected for me from this collection. Um, shall we just jump right in? Let's jump in. Okay. Um, well, the thing that I noticed first off is that they're all in, almost all of them are in what are called drop spine or clamshell boxes, which are really fun to put together. I really, um, but they're, um, they're made out of uh, kind of similar materials to, in, in fact, sometimes exact same materials as you make when you're actually binding a book. So book board, book cloth, um, materials like that. 
and they are real tanks as far as like protecting the items that are inside. Um, and so I often get people asking me to make them for um, like family heirlooms or very fragile items. Um, and, and especially they're great for protecting works of art like this. And what is that called? The a clamshell box clam or a drop box. spine box. Okay. Um, and yeah, so it's basically two trays um, that are in kind of like a book cover like format. Um, so that way you can close them up and you can stack them like, you know, flat like we have here, or you can sometimes even put them upright so that, you know, like you're shelving a normal book. Um, and they are made precisely to fit the items that are inside. So that way they don't get shook around and, and damaged while they're in, actually inside the box too. Okay. Um, so this one's called the Warrior Ant. Um, and it's neat because it has some beautiful end papers that were probably hand, hand printed as well. Looks like they were um, they were actually embossed too. They've got some texture to them. So let me let me just give a little detail about the book. This yeah. is the Warrior Ant. And these are poems by Lee Breuer, and the artwork was done by Susan Weil. And I think we'll see quite a few works by Susan Weil. Okay. And apparently Susan Weil was one of those great collaborators at Vincent Fitzgerald in uh, in New York City. Nice. And how many artists total do you know? Oh, or... we haven't done an artist count, but okay. there were quite there a few, are... quite a few different kinds of artists who worked with uh, Vincent Fitzgerald. Yeah, because when I was looking at their website a while back, it was quite an extensive list. I was very impressed. But um, so here we have, and it looks like there's a number of different pieces in this uh, particular collection, the Warrior Ant. Um, we've got a ginkgo leaf, and it looks like they may have even like use an actual ginkgo leaf to somehow make that impression. And you can see this, I guess would be like the, the title page booklet. Um, something that I've loved looking at all of these is just the, the gorgeous typefaces that have been used. There's something, I mean, typeface design is its own art in itself. And um, there's just something so inherently beautiful about the the particular ones that I, I'm not a printer myself, so I can't speak to that, but my gut just knows that they're gorgeous. <laughs> well, it seems that this entire collection has really beautiful materials, mm. beautiful typeface, obviously amazing artistry in terms of like the printmaking, yeah. the quality of the imagery, um, but it's just exquisite on every single level. Yeah. yeah. Well, and what's so, I mean, there's, there's making a blank book, but then there's making a set that has content and design, like, so what, what's so interesting about artist books, I find, is that there's so much thought that goes into it. Because not only are you making one potentially static piece of art, but then you have to think about how it interacts with all the rest of the things. You know, what's being revealed, what's being hidden at a time. And here's a good example of, you know, because this piece of um, paper here, you know, it itself is decorative and interesting. It's got the threads that are actually embedded through the paper. <laughs> um, so they, they put the, they must have laid the thread out while they were actually making the paper on the, um, on the frame where you, you know, when you're making paper, you actually have a vat of liquid full of cellulose material. And it could, when I say cellulose, it could be a whole bunch. It could be cotton rag. It could be wood pulp. It could be a whole number of things. And then you take a, frame that has a like a mesh and then you draw that frame out so that all the liquid falls through and then you get like a microscopic spaghetti mat of cellulose fibers but you can embed things into that like so, pieces this, of leaves so those and, lines are not printed on that page They're no that actual, actual thread yeah you can huh. see how the thread is actually like stuck into the piece of paper. So the cellulose fibers are actually like, I mean, if you looked at it microscopically, three-dimensionally, you would see basically just a spaghetti mass of stuff all around those, those taut threads. And then it looks like they burned a hole through the center, which is, you know, very interesting. But what it allows is when you have it stacked in the box, you can see just a little bit. It says, holy war is the one word and maybe peppercorn is another word that pops through. So you can through. peek into the poem yeah. hiding in the next page. Yeah. yeah, and that's something neat that maybe an artist book has an advantage over a, you know, a normal text, but most books are just page after page of text. You don't see, you know, to the next page. But 
So this is this is a book that isn't bound, right? So what we it have, doesn't look like it. It, it looks like it's just a group of um, folded leaves, basically. And that's where a book starts, right? Exactly. Yeah. So the the leaves themselves, um, you know, you start out with a sheet of paper folded and then nested with other leaves, and that sometimes is called a signature, although that's a little bit of a misnomer. More appropriately, it's called a choir, Q-U-I-R-E, which is great for Scrabble if you... A choir. <laughs> a choir. Like, not a squire, yeah, but a exactly. choir. A choir. Okay, good. Yeah. And so once you have a number of choirs, then the sewing goes through the, the fold, the gut, you know, the, where the, um, just the middle of the fold there. And, um, and those sewing stitches, then you connect all those choirs together to make a book block. Got it. And you can leave it, um, you just sewn without any kind of adhesive or like if you're thinking of a normal codex, um, you, can, you can apply some sort of adhesive, either like an animal hide glue or a wheat starch paste, um, you know, a PVA, which is kind of like fancy Elmer's glue. Um, and there's different reasons for using the, the different kinds of adhesives. And then that's what would be glued into uh, the covers, right? Right. Or so then the when, you have a, when you have a cover, a lot of people think that spine is actually glued into the spine of the cover. But more often than not, you're just gluing the two end sheets. The, so the very front page and the very back page of a book block, those get pasted down to the insides of the cover. The spines are left free so that when you're opening the book, oh, it can so flex. Can gotcha. So okay. something that I see a lot in my um, repair business is people take it upon themselves to DIY a repair, and they think that if they just squirt Elmer's glue oh, down the spine, <laughs> then everything will be fine. But actually, it's they're actually hurting the book by doing that. And then because PVA or Elmer's glue is non-reversible, then they've turned a potentially easy solvable problem into a much bigger mess and yeah. then therefore more expensive for them. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so for this book, I mean, this, that last page I showed you was a single sheet, but the other pages, you could potentially sew them together into a book. Um, so maybe the thread there is an allusion to like, what if we actually sewed this book, but yeah. we're not going to actually sew it together? Yeah, I'm curious because I don't, I don't know the, the content of this, of this book, but I'm curious if there's something about the threads and the burned hole, like maybe the hole is... Um, to resemble like the entrance to an ant hill or something like that. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So let's let's kind of dig dig through here a little bit, and maybe maybe it's a combination of like single sheets and folded ones. But we've got uh, the first part of the poem, an ant conceived, and some interesting decor on the back. It looks like uh, silver a silver paper that has been like cut out and then adhered to the tan paper. Yeah, more of it. And this is different font. And then the paper itself also, I don't know if you can see it, but it has a little bit of a um, embossing. So part of it is raised and sticking out. And if you flip it over, you can see that there are rulers um, that are on the back. And it, I wonder if they actually use the real ruler to, to make that mark. You know, sometimes yeah. you can actually use a physical object or you can make a replica of that object, you know, make you a stamp of it. And you press it and yeah. into, emboss it into the paper. Itself. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that's pretty neat. I, I would bet that they used a lot of real things here. Um, this looks very delicate. Because it looks like it's scored so that it can bend some. But we've got a, a bunch of leaves here on this um, sheet that has been had some sections cut out of it and it's also scored um, but it looks like maybe it's a bunch of other pieces that are multiple put sheets together, together. Yeah. yeah but yeah it has an interesting movement to it and then the next um, the next section of this poem and this one, I don't know if that's on purpose or not. <laughs> <laughs> Some kind of smoky pattern on the back yeah. of it. Yeah. And then oh. just another textured page. This is, these are so subtle. You know, the, pa the paper itself is, is thick like a cardstock, and then it's got a mottled color pattern, but it also has this texture that's very hard to see unless you kind of have raking light. Again, it looks like some objects have been kind of pressed into the paper as it was being made. 
You know, one of the things about the Vincent Fitzgerald collection, actually the Weinberg collection now, but, uh, but what is true about Fitzgerald's uh, books is that there are always surprises. Mm. And it's almost like every page, every, it, as you turn the pages, there's always some unexpected delight that takes place. Yeah. Uh, and this book is certainly a, a good example of that. Yeah. I mean, some of these I've seen through the, through the digital exhibit, so I kind of know what's coming. But, but this one is very fun. And this one is a whole... Do you want me to help yes, you Yes, I that? would okay. love to, because you are familiar with this. I knew how to know how to open it. I actually don't know how to open it. So <laughs> I, was just, I was trying to be helpful to you. But let's see. Oh, wow. This is yeah. I think, and is there a folding part there, too? I think oh, wow. that's the way Oh, boy. OK. So I'll take that end. You got that end, and, then... and I got this end. So yeah, looks almost like a like two halves. So here's the poem right there, mm -hmm. and it folds into the sheet. But you, as you can see, it's a it's a series of black and white uh, um, half circles. Yeah, kind of like phases of the moon or yin yang, kind of. That's neat. And something like that. I mean, that's. Just to put that together. <laughs> I could see why they didn't want to bind this book. <laughs> right, exactly. And should we just like kind of pop a pop ahead to see if there's any other groovy? Again, like some of, there's all, all these discoveries on the backs of the of each poem, just different designs. Or like this one, this looks like it could be almost a, a dog footprint. Print. <laughs> yeah, or, or fingerprints maybe. Yeah. Oh, and then there's something, the oh, Look and then there's that. here on the back, someone's hand kind of cradling a shell or an interesting object. And again, I mean, and this is what I love about books, too, is like they can be extremely complex with very like high quality materials. But they like this almost reminds me of something that you could make on your own at, you know, with construction paper. And that's what I mean, I when I teach classes, I teach you know, anywhere from little kids to, to grown adults. And, and it's so fun to see, like, you can use just scrap paper or, yeah. you know, old, old maps or, you know, whatever you have laying around that's interesting that... Um... And, and this, this particular book shows us in kind of such a diversity of approaches to a page. Mm. I mean, there's the printed page, and then there's the additional materials that one can add, and then yep. there's the cutouts and the foldouts. I mean, in some ways, it reminds me of medieval books, mm. the, the palimpsest, the idea right. of a medieval book might start as a, a list of vellum mm. pages, and then, you know, one monk passes it to the next monk, and then a generation later, somebody adds illustrations to that book, right. and then a generation later, somebody may rub out text and or add some more, yeah. scratch things off, or recycle pages, or mm. cut things out. I mean, the, the beauty of the book is that it's a dynamic thing. Exactly. So, I mean, that's a historical example, and this is a contemporary example. Right. But in some ways, it is, it's the, the notion that the book is a physical object yeah. that can have all these dynamic properties to it. Exactly. Yeah, and speaking of new, I'm just thinking of, I went a couple of years ago to the Library of Congress, and I just went on a, I was like, I'm, I have a couple of hours, I'm going to go see. I asked them, show me some interesting things from your special collections. And they brought me out this one book that had... Um, I think they're called Volvelles, but it's they, it was kind of like a three-dimensional book where you would open a page and then there were rings of other paper that were then bratted into the page. And this was a book from like the 1600s and you could turn all the different ah. wheels to line up to you know make some sort of astrological prediction. But um, you know, I feel like almost as long as we've been making books, we've been doing really um, crazy things with them. It's very right. sculptural. It Peter, I love what Peter Koch said that as long as humans have two eyes separated by a nose right. and hands, we will have books. <laughs> well, and I was thinking when I, because there, there have been a lot of scientific studies about why, I mean, I, I also don't think books are going anywhere because um, our, our bodies are so attuned to using them because of how our brains are structured mm -hmm. in a way that, like, it's easier for our brain to look at text and to when you're reading a book it's almost like you're looking at a map or you're walking through geography your brain knows where you are and so mm. it knows how much energy to store to make it to the end of the book or to get excited because you're already there when you're looking at a screen or a device your brain kind of short circuits because it doesn't know how far it has to go to get to the end it could be a small essay that you're reading or it could be war and peace and yeah 
you know, those are very different trips that you're about to take, but your brain is just like. And I, you know, I think about people who, who read Braille books. Mm. It's still a book. It is still right. something that can be, you know, that, that is held in the lap or yep. placed on the table in front of you. And, and, and it's read with tactily, but it's yep. still read in, in very much in the same way that, that people, sighted people, read books. Yeah, exactly. Um, and yeah, something about that physical experience of having the object, you're having such a, such a personal relationship with, a, you know, entering into dialogue with that author or creator. And, um, but it's still just, you know, it's all internal. It's all just... Internal and external, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, here's another one that's kind of, again, looks like two different printing, printing colors here, but on a cutout piece of paper. Oh, here's another interesting three-dimensional little booklet. So we've got dark navy with some doors here. Oh, it looks like many doors. Many doors. So, oh, yeah. I wonder. Ah, oh, look at that. Yeah. Oh. Ooh, la luna. La luna, <laughs> right, the moon. And it looks like that may have been originally sealed, was it? Or, oh, or was it just, just printed? Stamped. Yeah, stamped. I think just okay. printed there. Yeah, because there's another one there too. Yeah. Neat. And then one on the back as well. All right. I'm skipping through the poem. I hope that's okay. Since, uh, <laughs> okay yeah. I'm, I'm interested in the, the actual structures here. But this one's neat too. You know, you've got a, kind of an accordion. An accordion fold. Right. right and right. then with with uh, windows inside again so that you can see through to the next page and the text underneath i love that okay and then, is that it? yeah that's our last one and then again leaf pattern and it looks like it's been inlaid and then last one the credits with the the stars. Here are the stars. Nice. <laughs> stars of the book. Yeah. Beautiful. That's great. What a fun one. So that was uh, The Warrior Ant, poems by Lee Breuer, and The Artistry by uh, Susan Weil. Mm. Okay. Nice. So the next one is another book by Susan Weil. Okay. And this is called Metamor for the Moon. Not metaphor, metamor for the moon. I love this book cloth that's got such a, you know, I'm really drawn to dark blue, sort of indigo blue colors in there, so this um, already is my jam. <laughs> yeah, um, and I great. love the texture of it. It's kind of like a, it's a, it feels like a fine, a fine cloth, but still kind of raw, like a mm -hmm. raw. I mean, I don't think it's silk, but it's coarse. Yeah, coarse cloth. All right. Put this over here so we can see. So we've got a book here again. Looks like with the cut, you know, some three-dimensional quality to it. You know, you've got a cutout here to resemble the dark new moon. And then this book is um, bound in what's called a Coptic binding or chain link. There was, you know, when we went from scroll to pamphlet, this is the first structure. I mean, this structure is probably, you know, cl closing on 2,000 years old. Yeah. Um, but uh so coptic meaning it's ancient egypt right exactly Two thousand so, years ago yeah, yeah early so the, christian community in egypt yeah exactly yeah and um you know there you'll see other structures i mean when it's the chain link so that you'll also see like greek stitching it's the, it's essentially the same thing um, so so here we have a book that actually where the folios are am i uh, using the right term or choirs or the, the, or the right the, the choirs. choirs where the choirs are actually sewn yes using this coptic stitch and how many yep. different kinds of stitches are there from oh the lord um i mean they, they go on and on because you have uh unsupported and supported um stitching so unsupported is like this where the sewing itself actually makes like links into itself but then supported would be if you have some sort of piece of fabric or cord or um, like a leather strap or something like that, and the sewing actually somehow goes over or around it. Around that support. Yep, yeah. and then um, often that support is either directly sewn into the covers or maybe just adhered onto the inside of the cover underneath the, the end sheet. Um, so it's kind of sandwiched between the book board and the, and the end sheet. But this one, the, it's an unsupported sewing, 
and then the sewing actually connects directly to the front and back covers. Um, and I like it because when you, and it, this is, this kind of sewing is conducive when you have a lot of choirs. Um, when you just have a couple, you don't really get to see the, the beautiful chain. I mean, it almost makes like a braid mm. along the spine. Um, so you do kind of need a, a certain quantity of choirs together to really um, bring out that, that stitch. But. By the way, normally we would be wearing gloves, the Mickey Mouse gloves, when handling these books, but our, we washed our hands, both of us. We did. And, uh, and also because these books have so many moving parts, not mm -hmm. moving, but, but sort of elaborate parts, the risk of tangling them up with a glove or whatever exactly. is, is greater. So we're not wearing gloves right now. But. Yep. And, and that's actually something that I've been taught too, is that when you're handling books, for, because you lose so much dexterity with the cotton gloves, as long as your hands are nice and washed and you're not profusely sweating, right. uh, you should be okay. <laughs> and right, or your, your, you know, breakfast is still on your fingertips. Right, yeah. right. And, and as long as the book is not made out of like photographic or like really sensitive materials, yeah. um, then it should be okay. And so we have, I think we're going to go through the, my guess is we're going to go through the phases of the moon here. Is that? So we've got cutouts on each um, page. And you can see, I'm actually looking through multiple pages right now, but I can see part of the moon underneath that. So we have the waxing moon here. And then you finally get to the page that has the, the moon printed on it. So very simple structure. We just yeah. have you know, pages, but in this case, they've been cut out yep. to reveal the image behind, and that's the printed image right. of the moon there. And so that's the, the preamble. And so here we get to the center of one of, the, of one of the choirs and you can actually see the stitching there down the, the middle of it. I like that she's matched the color of the, the print to the thread the silver, too. yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, and that's a map showing the different parts of the moon. The named uh, uh -huh. parts of the moon. And then some, uh, like a neat sort of vellumy kind of paper that's been cut not to the same dimensions as the rest of the book, but um, like kind of a half moon. And vellum is an interesting term in book history, right? Vellum right. refers to what? Well, vellum was a, you know, technically is like a skin. An but, animal hide or exactly. skin. Yeah. But we're, I mean, you've heard of like architecture, vellum, it's kind of, it's like this sort of smooth sort of- And translucent. Kind of translucent paper, yeah. Exactly. So, and that's, you know, you find that a lot where there's lots of different, either different ways to say the same thing, like signature or choir or gathering, and then the opposite where one word might actually mean a couple different things. Yeah. So. And so this is not actual vellum in the, sen the historic sense of an right. animal skin, uh, but it's a, it's a paper that has been, you know, created to sort of mimic that translucency and the thinness of, of, of vellum. Right, exactly. Yeah. That looks like maybe when the dye was put down, maybe some salts or something were put on to absorb the, the pigment to make that kind of starry pattern. Mm -hmm. Again, more vellum, but this has some pattern printed on it, mm -hmm. almost like a ruler. Mm -hmm. And then here, woof, that is quite yeah. a color <laughs> shift. <laughs> a zing of color. Yeah. yeah. Well, and what's neat about this vellum too is that Again, just like we have the windows in the other book, this one you can still see the text through the... The, the paper itself. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Plato, Sea of Cold. And that also has... All these lunar associations. I know. Well, the moon is so transfixing. It's hard not to get inspired by it. And then we have some and, cutouts again, sort of yeah. the, the Matisse cutout tradition. And yeah. so, because she did this book also, right? That's you can right. kind of get, get a sense of uh, the artist's style from the, comparing the two books. Oh, and this is interesting. This is almost like a thicker card in the middle of the book. Yeah, and this reminds me of that page that we had in the other one that had the threads going through it. Yeah, to me, this is almost like just someone riffing on being inspired by the moon. I like it when an artist kind of takes one thing as their inspiration, but then just goes to town. That one 
Oh, there's that gorgeous blue. Yeah, oh, get ready. <laughs> <we> go. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so that was now a solar sun, association. Yeah. yeah, yeah, interesting. And is that <gasps> thread that I see running yep. through the paper again? Yeah, I mean, in this case, it's in a grid. It's in a grid, but when you turn the page, you can see how it kind of sticks out of the back side of that page. Well, and here you can see too where they probably had to join a new, they probably ran out of thread and, and had to join a new thread. Um, so you can see the knot that they made. And this is fun where they punched out on one side and then folded it to this side and glued it down into a, a star shape. So the next page should be gold. Yep. Yes, indeed. There and then we have is. the yeah. black from the other from side. From the other side. So they punched out a star pattern punched it through to one side, uh -huh. punched it through to this side. Yep. Yeah. You get that beautiful yeah. star illusion. And I love that all the, all the words on these pages are making references to locations on the moon. Made like, places, uh -huh. yeah. Yeah, and just the fun that you can have. I mean, this looks like they just had a, had a compass, but you can kind of start to get a sense of a ginkgo leaf from that, mm -hmm. uh, just playing around with circles and how they overlap each other. Oh, wow. What brilliant color. Yeah. Yeah, this book really wakes you up as far as, <laughs> you know, no muted. <laughs> you go from, from kind of muted colors to these very vivid wake up colors. And I, well, we know that, that, uh, that you're clearly not seeing this book in great detail here, but, uh, but you can go to our, uh, our YouTube channel mm. and we have a video of this book being open page by page and you can actually get a little bit closer to yeah. it. So. This is neat. It's almost like a little cell and little bacteria or something. Yeah, Just or like very simple or something. marks. Yeah. yeah. And I wonder if this is that um, kind of photo reactive paper where you set it out in the sun. Did you ever do that it's as like a kid? It's like a photogram, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. A very early photographic technique, yeah, yeah. Where you would set objects on the paper, then expose it to light, and then yep. it would be like a, actually, this would be like a cyanotype, but, right. but using that photogram uh, technique. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so maybe they did use little grains of rice on I, that one. I think so. That's my suspicion. All right. Credits page. Neat. So, another work by Susan Wilde, Metamorph for the Moon. Okay, so the next three books are actually quite interesting, and in some ways they are a kind of set, or at least a theme uh, for uh, Vincent Fitzgerald. Uh, these, are, these three books are all um, poems by the Persian, the late medieval Persian uh, poet uh, Rumi, uh, Jalaluddin Muhammad Rumi. And so there are three books, and they're, they all have very, very interesting bindings. Mm. So let's start with the first I'm excited. one. excited. Well, this, this one caught my eye right off the bat because um, it's still a clamshell box, but it is not square. And so I was like, <laughs> it really kind of broke my brain a little bit when I was like, I was like did they do that on purpose? But, did they make a mistake? Yeah. I uh, got it. <laughs> uh, no, but... It's, it would be you know, much more challenging to make a non-square uh, box than, than a square one. And it looks like they've got some sort of, um, almost like a slate yeah. that's adhered to the front it, and back. It feels it's very like heavy. It feels like it's metal. Yeah. I don't know what that material is on the, uh, on the box itself. Right. It, could, it could be stone, it could be a very thin piece of stone, yep. or it could be a piece of metal. Or, yeah, it has a does, great texture. Yeah. And it's got, um, when you run your hand over it, it's got this inscribed line down the center on the front and the back, too. And I think that's intentional. I bet and, it is. And, yeah. So this is actually, uh, it's On the Art of Painting by, uh, by Rumi. Okay. And there's your line. Yeah. So even though the box isn't square, part of the book, like it looks like the book cover is, but not the entire book. The book is cockeyed. <laughs> <laughs> That is amazing. And just, it, but it's intentionally cockeyed. Intentionally cockeyed. If you cockeyed, flip it yes. over, you notice that there it is again yep. on both sides. And then, and then it makes sense in terms of like why the book, why the box for it is not square. Right. So if you can see here, and that line that runs through it just emphasizes how the book isn't square. Mm. Yep. The, this, whole, this whole set's kind of breaking my brain. And I'm like, <laughs> I just want to go like this. <laughs> But yeah, we have 
again, you can't see maybe, but there is a, there's an embossed line here that kind of cuts down the front cover. And then as we open it, we see um, an echoing of the paper that was used on the inside of the box on the art of painting. And it looks like we're gonna have this line carry through as a, right. as a connector piece right. through the whole book. So the book is in English, the poems are in English at, on this end, uh -huh. and you read it from left to right as you would English, but oh. then the, that end of the book is actually in Arabic. Oh, and then you read it the and opposite you read it way. the opposite. That's and so maybe that's why the book feels like it could be reversed. Yeah. And, but it's, it's not, you don't have to flip it upside down or you anything don't, like that. No. So here's the center of the book, the dividing part. And then we can see... And that's such a gorgeous brown, yeah. reddish brown color. Yeah. So now we'll actually, I mean, we're turning it as if we were reading English, but we're, go, we're actually going backwards through, that's the, right. through the Arabic part. And the, uh, the, the collaborator here with, um, with Vincent Fitzgerald was Zara Partobi, who's actually done a number of these books. And I believe she was also, she was a translator mm. and, so, um, and a Rumi expert. And so wow. she's actually highly present in, uh, in the Fitzgerald collection. Oh, wow. And this, this writing is so fine and compared to some, I mean, I, I feel like the, the type for the English was a little more like thicker. Yeah. Not as fine, but this is go. just absolutely gorgeous. There's the English text yeah. and then the Arabic text. Here. Very delicate. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a neat one. I like that. And do we have any sense of, because I, I haven't read this poem, but of why, why they thought to cockeye the, the book covers? I, I don't know. I haven't read the text yeah. of it. I wonder uh, if there's something that mirrors well, the text. In you know, it. one of the characteristics of, of Rumi's poetry is that there's this amazing wit to mm. it. And often kind of this interesting juxtaposition of imagery, you know, where, where and, and, and language is also used in a lot of sort of dualities where, you know, it sounds like it's going in this direction, but it actually winds up in this direction. Mm -hmm. and so that duality of his, his style, his poetic style, I think is what is being carried over into the, uh, the design of this particular yeah. book. That's neat. Well, and this, the way this book is structured too kind of reminds me of just the durability of physical books. Like I, I actually watched a video once of someone who was making books that are called leather long stitch. So it's literally, it's a medieval style of book. It's a piece of leather that the pages have actually been sewn into the leather. So the leather is just the cover and then you have a strap that wraps around. He said, my books are so durable, you can use them as a soccer ball. And it was like him and his buddies playing soccer with a book but then you could open it and still read it. And so like you can, a book can have heaps of abuse put on it. You know, you can, it can go through a fire. It can, you know, um, because they're so packed together, often just like the outer edge of it gets singed, but it still is functioning as a book. I, I remember as a kid in elementary school, uh, reading books, textbooks actually, that were, had, that had been around from like the, the 1950s and 60s. Yeah. I mean, think about those books, the wear and tear that those books saw in generation after generation totally. of school kids using the same textbook. Yeah. And, you know, and still there they were, durable, the imagery, you know, yeah. the, the binding, everything was still intact. Yeah, and like, do you have any jazz drive discs still around? <laughs> do you remember uh, what I'm talking I about? I didn't even know what that is. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it just goes to show like our digital media becomes obsolete so fast. That's right. Um, Whereas these the physical point. things are, are still with us. Yeah. yeah. Okay, here's the second Ooh, book. Oh, this is the one I'm excited this about. This is the second book by, okay. uh, by Rumi, and this one is called Deception. Deception. And again, this, this uh, book material, the book cover material feels a lot like the moon one that we looked at, just maybe different color. Right. And then they use that book material through the, the book cover material through the whole inside as well. And again, we have a, um, a linked sewing, so like a Coptic binding that's uh, in the black thread that's connecting to this black cover that looks very like an amorphous cloud. Mm -hmm. Oops. Oh, and we've got some neat paste papers as the, as the end sheets here. Deception. I love this font. <laughs> it's gorgeous, isn't it? Yeah. This typeface is just gorgeous. Beautiful typeface. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, yeah. and the si what's neat too is that the, the size of it, like it's just, it's very readable, uh, which is something that I'm appreciating more and more as my <laughs> eyes start going. <laughs> yeah. um, but even like certain fonts have much more readability than, than others. Yeah. And, um, and just like the space around the text too. There's a yeah. lot that goes into the design of just text and how it's laid out that I don't think a lot of people think well, about I, it's I, so ubiquitous. I, I think, for example, this is how, how non-conventional this is. I mean, we expect, you know, one inch borders, we expect, uh -huh. the, you know, uh, justification on the left hand side or, or things centered. And here we have this kind of a very unusual, also the relationship between the size of the font to the size of the page is, that, right. is unusual. Yeah. There, so many of these books actually offer us um, variations on the norm, mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. to speak. Yep. And notice here that how it slid over to the to the left. Right. So yeah. We have so a we much wider, mm -hmm. a much wider. Um, yeah. Uh, instead of the two two blocks of text like we had on the other pages, and then this one we've got a three dimensional element, so a folded and a cut up. punched page, mirrored over here by more another paste paper. These ones are really cool. And I think we've got a but big fold, a big fold out here. There you go. Yeah. Woo! So we're opening this as if you were the reader out there were actually reading this page. But mm. this now invites the possibility that this book could actually be, you know, seen vertically oh, sure, rather like than a horizontally. Mm -hmm. Right, like a scroll. Neat. And all the while, I keep wondering, what does this have to do with the poem of yeah. deception or the concept of deception? And to me, this, like, you know, when you see diagrams of light going through a prism and how the light is refracted, too. Mm -hmm. Some more of that. I love those colors, out. that red and black. Mm -hmm. So actually, I think this is a mirror. Isn't that oh. a mirror of what happens with this page? Oh, yeah. The... Oh, wow, look at that. That is so fun. And that's what I love about artist books too. Versus, you know, you've got text as a normal book, but then you've got the art, but also this three-dimensional element that is inviting you to interact in a different way with a book and more like a sculpture. That's right. The book becomes sculpture. Yeah, it, except it's, you don't fully, usually... it's fully in the third dimension now. Yeah, but you get to actually like handle it in a way that you know, you're not going to interact with a sculpture in a museum, right? Right. And then there's the Arabic text. Neat. And not as like delicate as the other one, but still beautiful. No, I mean, that's what calligraphy comes in so many different forms. <laughs> that's a funny signature. <laughs> All right. Wonderful. The second text by Ruby, and that one's called Deception. Mm -hmm. By the way, all of these books are currently in the exhibition at the uh, uh, Malloy Gallery. And now for this one. All right, now this I one. I better set this one in the middle. Yeah, exactly. And now I watched a video, the video on the, um, on the YouTube page that you guys have of, of opening this, and it looks, it's so delicate. It looks like with this fine, this fine thread that is both on the, the outside as the as the uh, closure, but on the inside as well as we will find out. So this is a, another book of uh, poetry by, uh, by the Persian poet um, um, Rumi. And this one is called Fragments of Light 5. And we actually have two uh, fragments of light. So there's one in the gallery currently that is, oh, wow. that is printed Open. on glass. Uh -huh. And then we have this one, number five, which is uh, it, unique in its own way. Uh -huh. And what I was reading was that she wanted this to resemble kind of a lantern um, and that the outside covering, which is almost, it might even actually be suede. So it's this dark, light absorbing suede to resemble the sort of outer covering of a lantern. And as we open it, we'll see, and this is a different kind of box than what we've seen previously. This is more of like a, a Japanese style box with the four flaps that wrap around the object inside. Um, but yeah, the, the mirror is what really drew me to it. So we have this black suede on the outside, but the interior of the box actually has this um, highly reflective 
what is it like yeah, a, like a plastic, mylar, or mylar plastic mm -hmm. material but it, it reads like a mirror on the interior mm -hmm. actually i think you can yeah. see that on that particular panel and it yeah. unfolds and like, then the yeah that so i think what i remember her saying was that the the actual pages are articulated in a similar way to like bamboo slatted uh, chinese style of books so kind of a comic, not quite a scroll but definitely not quite what we think of as a book so um, this is a non-Western tradition that we're looking at. All these books that so. we've seen are very much the, the kind of the traditions of Western book binding mm -hmm. in you know, the Mediterranean basin uh, right. for you know, the last at least 2,000, maybe yeah. close to 3,000 years. Mm -hmm. This comes from Asia, this, this kind yep. of book in terms of the, both the box and in terms of how the, how the, the information is, is written, right? Right. right. Or printed on, on the materials. Yeah, because... I think um, the, the Chinese versions, they would use slats of bamboo. So let's, let's unfold it okay. so that they can... Let's see if I can figure out which page comes first. Okay, so we've got this guy. Okay, and I will take... Let's see. And so you can see how each section is, is articulated but sewn to the next one. And then what is probably hard to see is that there's writing on this side is in English, this side is in Arabic. Um, actually inscribed into the, um, I think they're, are they acrylic? The I think slides? they are. Okay, so let's, let's do this. Hold up that side. So yeah. there are four, four panels, and the panels are composed of individual slats, I guess mm -hmm. we'd call them. And in, traditionally in China, these slats would have been made out of bamboo, right? Mm -hmm. Some uh, kind of woody material, and they yep. would be written on. Uh, and then, you know, so, so that allows for us to lay them out, yeah. you know, uh, um, or hold them up yep. to read them. So in this case, they've been printed on uh, a plastic, uh, plexiglass mm -hmm. kind of material. Yeah, like etched into. And yeah. then what, what I think she's trying to get at, too, is that you have this beautiful, like, deep red center symbolizing the the interior of the lantern, the illuminating portion of right. the lantern, but you also, as you're interacting with the book, because of the reflective pages, you're actually seeing yourself in it as well. So if you hold up all four sides, you actually can see that this is in fact the lantern. And of course, since this is, the, the book is called Fragments, or the poem is called Fragments of Light, it's really about light being fragmented, mm -hmm. right, or, or mm -hmm. split apart as these panels or these slats tend to fragment. It. Right, right. Oh, that's such a fun, fun book. What a lot of planning went into that one, too. <laughs> and, and the, you know, the threads that are used are actually colored mylar, or it, mm. it's almost like a fishing wire. Yeah, yeah, I've got blue and like a deep red on mine, and then some kind of like a red shell as the, as the little dongle here that keeps it together. What did you call it? <laughs> a dongle? dongle. <laughs> dongle, dongle. My, that, my brain fills in with weird stuff if oh. I can't come up with the right word. You should have been at James Joyce's well presentation <laughs> with Dr. Hardy. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so there, yeah, so this is the introductory, uh, the introductory panel and yep. it actually has the date on there. And, and that this one looks like the credits the one. The credits, so sort of like the colophon. Yep. Is that it? Yep, uh, type calligraphy, laser etching, binding. So that carries the same kind of information that all those books carry in terms of like, you know, uh, uh, the date of publication, you know, the, the, the type font that was used mm -hmm. and the players, the people who actually yeah. are involved in the, in the creation of the object. Yeah. So pretty, pretty interesting. Uh, and I, it really, I, I think it's the only non-Western uh, binding technique or bookmaking technique in the, in the entire collection. Oh, really? That's yeah. interesting. Huh. Yeah, because I, I know that these, these boxes are very, are very popular, and um, I've seen a lot of people getting into like Japanese and Chinese-style stab binding, where you just have a stack of pages, and sometimes you'll even have the pages, they're folded on what's called the foredge. So, you know, we, when, in Western books, the fold is on the spine. Mm -hmm. The page, you know, where you turn the pages, that's called the foredge. And so in Japanese binding, the fold is out here, and then the sewing goes straight through the stack of pages and kind of wraps around. And I think what was going on was these were very cheaply made books. Um, at more, like it's our 
kind of antecedent to manga, manga comics. Yeah. So there were like magazines produced just lots of them and they would use woodblock prints to print and then fold them and stamp, get them out to I the see. public. And so the binding would be a very, very simple, you know, one, basically uh, usually one. Four, usually four, four stitches, holes. Four yep. holes, okay. And then the, the thread goes straight through the stack and then usually wraps around the spine and goes back through the same sewing station and then down to the next one, wrap around. Um, so let me ask you this question, and maybe this is a, you know, I, I think we have a little time for this, but, okay. but is there a history of buying a book binding? Like, for example, can you trace every one of these types mm. and, and, and find its lineage? Do they, do those, do those converge Pretty, at some yeah. point? Do they, um, I mean, it's kind of like uh, a lot of technology where you'll see um, the same kind of technology evolve in different locations independently of each other. So, you know, while we think of Gutenberg as making movable type, there's also some instances of Chinese type being, being made totally, they were not related to each other. You know, you have individual letters over here, whereas in, in China you're having the, the, the whole character. Yeah. So, um, but they evolved separately. And same thing with, with books too, you know, you have um, scrolls and the, like the Nag Hammadi Codex, this is all in the, um, you know, around the, the Holy Land, but then you also have scrolls and books in Asia as well. But I did have a couple, I have to look to see if I have a couple of the, the Japanese style bindings that, um, that I was talking about, those stab bindings. They're this. called stab bindings. Yeah, okay. I mean, they have a Japanese name for them that is currently escaping me, but those are the... Oh, the different kinds of, uh, yeah. of, of, uh, of bindings, okay. So here you can see, and this one, I, I didn't fold the pages, but imagine that the, like you can see with the cover, the cover actually has that style where the, the page, the foredge is where the fold is, and I the see. loose edge is on the spine. I see, so that's the, a reversal of, of the Western style book where this would be the loose end. Right, yeah. so when you have all the pages folded, you're almost losing half of the writing surface from the inside. Um, I've also seen them translated as like pocket book because the pout, it makes a little pocket almost there. Now, I actually have a, 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 a series of books from the 19th century where this is true, that, that these, but these haven't been cut. Right. So, and, it, and my impression was that one would cut them with a, with a, paper, a paper knife. A paper knife. Yeah. yeah. So the book would be actually bound and, and, and this, this edge would actually still be folded yeah. and would need to be actually cut and you would cut it as you read it, right? And so what's going on there is the, the printer is printing all the pages on one sheet of paper. Yeah. And then that sheet of paper goes to the binder and they fold it down to whatever size, you know, 16, 16th of what the original is. And then it's just bound through the main, uh, the main gutter there. And then it's up to the owner to open all those pages or with a paper. Or to leave them be. Yeah, or to leave them be. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it makes it harder to read if you, can't, <laughs> exactly. if you don't cut it open. But yeah. I know that a lot of uncut books these days are um, very valuable. So, um, But yeah, here's the, this is the leather long stitch that I was telling you about. Um, so you can see the, you know, it's just one piece of leather that is then the, the signatures are actually bound th directly through that piece of leather wow. and it's very sturdy. <laughs> That's the soccer ball. Book, <laughs> That's the right? soccer ball one, right, <laughs> exactly. But this is just like we were talking in the beginning with the palimpsest, um, you know, these were often used as accounting books and what would happen is once you finished filling up the pages, you could just snip out the, um, the pages and then reuse oh, re the value of all the cover. Yeah. I see. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, and that's another wonderful history too of books. I mean, historic books, they were recycled. Hmm. The pages, even the pages themselves were often recycled. Oh yeah. Right? Sometimes they were complete because they were skinned. You know, you could take a knife and actually scrape off the old ink and what they've been finding, they've actually been discovering some amazing old texts that we thought were lost, like the Archimedes Codex. Right. They found um, under, I think it was a Byzantine hymnal, they did x-ray um, imagery of it, and they, they could actually see the original ink that had been scraped away because right. of the ghostly image that was left. So that you would use infrared or other kinds of lights exactly. to actually see the imprint or the, 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 the signature left on, the, on those pages from earlier, yeah. earlier iterations. 
I'm very excited about what's happening with uh, uh, laser scanning mm -hmm. and, and those, those Pompeian books. Oh. Or, actually, they're not Pompeian. I think they're from Herculaneum. Mm. Scrolls of books. Oh, yes, that, that they were, can't open. That they can't be opened because, right. you know, opening them would be to destroy them. Right, they would just turn into ash. <laughs> and, 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 but now our technology, our sort of x-ray technology mm -hmm. is allowing us to actually uh, uh, see through those texts right. and to reconstruct that digitally, yeah. to unfold them digitally. I, I, think I know, when I saw that, it blew my mind. It's very, very exciting. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so... so. Any other uh, interesting uh, findings that well, we could talk about? What there? what I love too about you know about seeing all these artist books, but then knowing you know people are still coming up with all kinds of innovative book structures. Um, so it's still like this evolving craft. And I had a couple. This one is called a blizzard book because the person who invented it was I guess there was a, an epic blizzard and. Uh, she was stuck in her house for multiple days and just with you know all her paper around her and she was like well i guess i'll invent a new book structure um but so this book um is actually just all folded pieces and then what i love about it is these pages actually just come right out they're just oh, held see. kind of by this origami style of spine and so you can you know do art on them or you could replace them with photographs or cool. postcards cool, cool, cool. Um, it's very you know, you can use different color, you know, you can, I, when I've taught this class, I've had some um, students that have had really amazing color combinations that have been really fun. And then... Uh, blizzard style. Blizzard wow, book, yeah. That's neat. So these are, these are of your own making, right? All of these Yeah, books? these are just like miniature. I, I wanted to make a bunch of miniature ones to be able to just show people like a whole bunch of different kinds of... Uh, and these are book the books that, and these are the kinds of books that you actually sell at and and build at uh, the best right? yeah exactly so um, and I like to keep them blank because that way people can use them as a journal or a sketchbook or or what have you you know I do often bind um, like thesis or dissertations or sometimes people will make a like they'll write their own book and they but they don't want to go to a publisher they just want a couple of copies for their family or sometimes they are presenting it to a publisher and they want to have a nice yeah kind of professional looking thing. Um, but yeah, these are, you know, now I'm, I used to be, have a physical shop, but now I'm all online. So, um, and I do a lot of custom work. So if there's people come to me with ideas, uh, like recently I had a, um, someone who wanted a gift for, um, for a partner and I made a book called a Dosa Dose book because they wanted, um, like grid paper and blank paper for garden planning. And oh, basically nice. what it was, Dosa Dose is... It's kind of two books Spanish, sandwiched together. Dos a dos. Right. Two, two to two. Two to two. Two by two. Yeah, so it would be like if I had two regular co codexes or codices, but the, the middle cover is shared. So it opens ah, this see. way and it opens this way. I see. So I had blank paper on one side and grid paper on another side. Very which neat. Which was fun. But here's another cool one, the, the Belgian binding, which is uh, the, the actual cover pieces themselves are woven together in a neat kind of pattern. And then the signatures are sewn and they're kind of the sewing loops. It catches the thread that goes on the inside of the spine piece. And you kind of use that as a sewing support. Beautiful. So, yeah, and this, this is a modern binding as well. I mean, maybe like the 90s probably. Um, so, so people are still inventing these. Absolutely, yeah. Well, we have to wrap things up, okay. but uh, how do people find you if they need to, uh, yeah. if, if they have books that they want to bind or if they're interested in, in, in learning more about, uh, about this amazing craft? For sure. Um, I have a website, www.thevespieri.com, and uh, that's spelled, it's, Vespieri is a strange word, and people often ask me, what does that mean? It's actually a wasp's nest, and wasps were one of the inspirations for... Um, for wood-based paper making. Oh, right, because they make paper. Exactly. The wasp nest. Yeah, and the my vespiary. First, the vespiary. And my first uh, location was this kind of uh, shack that was had a bunch of paper wasp nests in it. <laughs> so uh, when I was casting around for a name, that was it. But it's it's uh, T H E V as in Victor E S. P I A R Y dot com. So those wasps were reminding you of reminding you who the original artist was. Exactly. Right? <laughs> we're all we're, a lot of us are inspired by nature. So oh. um, yeah, thevespiri dot com or just bookbinding Missoula will get you to me on a Google search as well. And it's Audra A U D R A. Yep. Loyal. Just like the word. L O 
Y A L. Yep, correct. Audra Loyal. Well, thank you, Audra. It's, it's been, been my delight. pleasure. Thank you so much for these great. revealing these wonderful books to us and how they they're composed, how they were configured. So, great. Um, uh, our next and final bookish reveal will take place on Thursday, December tenth, at eleven a.m. Um, so join us for a conversation with Dr. Lisa Simon, who will talk to us about Franz Kafka. Uh, and his presence in the Weinberg Collection. So thanks again for your participation. If you're interested in a complete program of these bookish reveals, we're now coming to the close of the program, uh, please check us out at umt.edu forward slash Montana Museum. umt.edu forward slash Montana Museum. Until then, thank you and take very good care.